So there's been a lot of discussion lately about the 25th Amendment, and I'm going to attempt today to do something that's probably impossible, which is talk about the legal requirements of the 25th Amendment without getting into any of the politics. Wish me luck. The 25th Amendment is one of the best written amendments to our Constitution. I say this because it solved a very real problem that has led to at least the potential for constitutional crisis a number of times in our country's history. What many people don't know is that the original text of the Constitution, without the amendments, doesn't actually say anything about who becomes president if the president dies or is unable to discharge his office. Now, John Tyler, the 10th president of the United States, when William Henry Harrison died, not only agreed to be the acting president, which is sort of what the text of the Constitution implies, but said that he was the president. He had himself sworn in, he gave a, uh, a, an inaugural speech, and a lot of people didn't like that. He fully exercised the powers of the office. He didn't just kind of act as a caretaker for the office until the next election happened. That set a really important precedent, sometimes called the Tyler precedent, that then held sway for all of the other vice presidents that, uh, that were sworn into office. But it actually wasn't until the 1960s, with the adoption of the 25th Amendment, that that became a, a, an actual part of our constitutional structure. The 25th Amendment has four parts. The first clarifies the Tyler precedent. It says that when the president dies, the vice president becomes president. He is fully the president of the United States. The second gives, for the first time, an opportunity for the president to pick a new vice president if there's a vacancy in the office of the vice president. So for you know, roughly the first, I guess, 150 years of our, our country's history, if a president died and the vice president stepped into the office, that second chair, the vice presidency, remained totally vacant. There was no mechanism in the Constitution to appoint that person. And there was a lot of concern about that because kind of in the modern era, you know, in the old days, if a war was going to happen, we usually knew, you know, a ship had to sail across the ocean, horses had to gallop. Um, but now we're living in an era in the last, you know, 50 to 70 years where nuclear bombs and missiles and, uh, and fast moving ships and, and, and vehicles can mean that war can be on our doorstep all of a sudden. So there's this real concern of what happens if we have a vacancy in the vice presidency and then we lose our president. There's a potential for a constitutional crisis. There's also another problem, which was if a president is shot, as JFK was, if he dies, we know what happens. But what happens if he's in a coma? He's still technically the president. Can the vice president start acting as president? So that's why we get sections three and four of the 25th Amendment. So the third uh, section of the 25th Amendment allows a president to voluntarily yield over his office to the vice president for a period of time. If he's uh, having surgery, if he's expecting to be uh, unavailable for a while, if something's happened in his life that he can't focus or concentrate, if he has what is called an inability to discharge the duties of his office, he can say, vice president, just take over, and then he can take it back whenever he wants. This has happened really only three times in our country's history. Some scholars debate a fourth time, and that doesn't really matter right now, but they can voluntarily step aside and then reclaim the office after several hours or after a successful surgery. But Section 4 is what we're all here to talk about and what we're interested in. Section 4 of the 25th Amendment provides that if the President of the United States can't discharge the duties of his office and he's unwilling to step aside, at that point, the Vice President and a majority of the Cabinet can force him aside because they recognize that disability. So if the Vice President goes to the Cabinet and gets a majority of the Cabinet to agree, they can have the President stepped aside while the Vice President acts as president during that time. Uh, now, the mechanism for doing that allows the president to contest it. The individuals who wrote the 25th Amendment were very concerned that there might be a situation where the vice president essentially triggers a coup. So the way that this section four works, and if you read it, you'll see this, this procedure of back and forth. The vice president and a majority of the cabinet vote if they send over to the Speaker of the House and the President pro tempore of the Senate. That's typically the longest serving member of the Senate their uh, belief that the president is no longer able to discharge the duties of his office, the vice president takes over immediately as president of the United States, as the acting president, I should say, during that time. The president can then contest that. He immediately serves on the same two people, the Speaker of the House, the president pro tempore of the Senate, often called the president pro tem, and says, no, I am able to discharge the duties of my office. The president takes back over. So you have this back and forth, and then the vice president and majority of the cabinet have to again tell the speaker and the president pro tem, no, he's not able to discharge the duties of his office. At that point, the president remains in control, but the Senate and House have to convene to have a vote on whether they believe the president is able to discharge the duties of his office. So the timelines work like this. 
Vice President says we think he's not able. President says I am. Vice President within four days has to say no, he's not. At that point, the Congress has 48 hours to assemble both houses to vote on the issue, and they have 21 days from when they assemble to vote by a two-thirds majority, both of them, to say that the president is unfit to discharge the duties of his office. Now, this has never happened. This Section 4 provision has never happened. We've never had this issue in American history. Um, we came close during the, the maybe the assassination attempt of President Reagan. That's about as close as we've ever come to that process being triggered. And it's unclear what the Senate and House would consider. Would they call doctors to testify? Would they subpoena records? We don't know. If they don't make a decision with 21, within 21 days, the president continues in office, and he continues all throughout that time. So there's a lot of steps that have to be taken here. One thing I've noticed in some of the things that have been written about this process lately, and that's been in the news lately, is that a lot of people seem unaware, though, that Congress also, when they passed this constitutional amendment, they wrote in sort of a fail-safe, which is, Congress is relying on the vice president and a majority of the cabinet to do this. But Congress can also, by law, they can pass a bill that says that they want someone other than the cabinet to be that additional vote on the president's inability. The vice president and a majority of such other body as Congress may designate. Now, they left that open because they had the idea that Congress might set up a, a panel of doctors who see the president regularly or a panel of totally uh, disinterested justices of, the, of, of a court or something like that. They can pick ostensibly any body to be that instead of the cabinet, but the vice president still has to be involved. So at the end of the day, for Section 4 of the 25th to be, to be invoked, the vice president would have to be the one to say, I think the president is unfit and get a majority of another body that Congress could, could designate uh, to make that agreement. So that's just a little bit about the 25th Amendment. Uh, I always love talking about this amendment because it's actually something that protects us from constitutional crisis. It leaves in the hands of people who are around the president the opportunity to say if they believe that he is unable to discharge the duties of his office. So uh, as you discuss, be kind to one another in the comments section. We look forward to your feedback, and uh, hopefully this video is helpful to you in understanding our Constitution.